It's like this sermon is about to take off. Man, if you hear something like that before you preach, it makes you want to like shout. And I was like crying, and now I'm shouting, so I don't know. Somewhere in all of that, we just come together. Um, hey, if you are first-time guest here, um, man, I, I'm glad you're here. You gave us part of your weekend. I mean, that's, thank you. You're busy. You're, it's Christmas time, too, so like, man, and, and what is it with like Christmas time, too? Like, maybe this is a place for rest for you. Like, you're, you're probably like just glad you're not at Kroger right now. Like, it's not a great, I was just like, I had to get a couple things last night. It's like milk, and I ran in there, and it was just, every line is long, and I wasn't complaining. I'm not complaining now. I'm just and then the people are just, you could see it in their eyes. They're just, this is crazy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's like, okay, all right, Christmas, everybody calm down. We're going to have a good time. So maybe this is a place for refuge for you today. I hope that it is. Um, our ushers right now, they're going to pass out some Bibles. This is meant to be helpful for you so you can follow along. Um, if you forgot yours or if, even if you don't own a Bible, I encourage you to grab one of these. Keep it as a gift from us to you. Um, you know, I, there's something I can't kind of shake out of my head, and that is... Um, I'll just dive right in. So if, if you know, uh, James mentioned about the um, Pearl Harbor, and, and it's in that same sentiment, you know, the holidays, a lot of times you, you have military people. I don't know if we have military people in the house, but, and you have someone come home. And I think about just a, uh, an analogy for a second, and bear with me because I just made this up five seconds ago. Um, and that analogy is this. If you are a child and your father is coming home from afar and been gone for afar. Is that a happy moment for you or a bad moment? Well, the answer to that question is whether it was a good father or a bad father. You see, our culture is, has been for a long time asking the question, is this true? But I feel that our generation is asking, is it good? And uh, it's not even the passage for today, but Luke 2 says, angels show up and they say this. I just think, you're like, why is he emotional already? Especially after blaring music in our ears. <laughs> if you're outside of this you know, you're an outsider to Christianity. You wouldn't call yourself a Christian or you, you feel like you're unsure. I think of you like my own child. Um, and I think of my own children. Um, and so it's, it's real to me. And I want to be very careful everything I say because I care for you. And I want you to, I want to help you, help the light come on. But the angels declared in, in Luke 2, Fear not, for behold you, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. So we, maybe we still have to ask the question, is it real, is it true? But they said it's good news, great news for joy for all people, all people. Despite your brokenness. The thing you think is standing between you and God. Oh, I'm not churchy. I'm not, I'm not good enough. You feel so far from God, but God wants you to be so close to him. And that is first and foremost the impossibility that became possible in the miracle of Christmas. Because we who were far, that's why the angel said it's good news for all people. We who were far, we who, who couldn't have a way to get to God on our own, now have a way to get to God. That, what was impossible, became possible, and that's the story of Christmas. So we rewind to Luke 1, and this is, this is the story of Mary, a young girl. It says... In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. So he's a royal bloodline. And the virgin's name was Mary. 
And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. First thing an angel says is, You are beautiful inside and out. I see your spirit. You, you are favored. She's thinking, I've never seen an angel. No one I know has ever seen an angel. I'm not even sure I believe in angels. What in the world is standing right in front of me? Who are you going to call Ghostbusters? No? Okay. Steve, you're so intense. And then I break, make the jokes to break the awkwardness. It's for me, and you guys just get to come along on that roller coaster ride. I'm sorry and not sorry. Okay. Oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. She's like, I, she doesn't even know how to piece this together. Because listen what it says in verse 29. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern the sort of greeting that might be. This is a real person. She is dealing with doubt, fear, and trying to understand. An angel showing up is something impossible becoming possible. I mean, this is not, I know as we read this, we hear a story about an angel came to Joseph, an angel came to, comes to Elizabeth, an angel comes to this person, an angel comes to that person, but the reality is, is that there's been hundreds of years where this kind of stuff hasn't happened, and, and the reality is, is that for most of us who read this, it hasn't happened to us. I mean, I, I would go out on a limb and say, you've never seen an angel. So sometimes we read the Bible, if you're like me, you're like, this is big. This feels bigger than me. How do I come close to this? How do I get near this? How do I even, like, here's my life, and here's this supernatural book. How do I, like, how do those two come together? This is big. An angel. Like, most of us, if the story stopped there, we would be going, that's hard to believe. An angel showed up. Like, we always just read over that at church. Like, it's so quick. Like, but, like, most of us would be like, like, if you saw an angel last night, I promise you, like, we know this is true. This is like, I'm not going out on a limb here. Like, if you saw an angel last night, and you came in here today, you go anywhere today, you go in Kroger where it's crazy. If you go anywhere, you're telling somebody, you're like, oh, an angel. Or you, actually, the verse might be true. You might be like, I'm not telling anybody. I just saw something. Maybe that's a weird pizza I had. I don't know what's going on. But, like, it would, it would be stuck up in your crawl. I mean, you would be like, how do I deal with this? How do I rationalize this? How do I make logical sense of this when the supernatural is standing in front of me? What am I supposed to do with that? She didn't like see an angel and go, oh yeah, it's just an angel. I see those all the time. She's troubled deeply and greatly just by the fear, mere fact of like what's standing in front of me. And, and in that way, what I would like to just kind of even make even more clear is that this should make a total bridge for all of us to go, this is, this is real. Her reaction lets us know this is not just a book of a bunch of myths where everybody just like, oh yeah, we're used to seeing angels. No, it, it's... These are real people who struggled with real things and had doubt and, and lack of faith at times and are like, they would be just as surprised as you to see an angel. Okay, so I just had to like say that because I feel like it's important to us as we go through this journey. She's greatly troubled at the saying, trying to discern. She's trying to figure this out, what's going on here. And the angel said to her, now angels, historically, from what we gather from scripture, these are messengers of God. So when they speak, a lot of times they're speaking on behalf of God. So another encouragement right now is that this angel doesn't look at her and go like, you're an idiot, I'm an angel. Like God meets her where she's at and like realizes, I got to talk you through this a little bit. So we, we can see, if you track with me, you can see this journey of Mary. I don't know if you've identified this ever before. For me, I just realized, okay, she's a person who, who is, has struggles and doubts and fears, and she kind of moves towards faith, but she, as she's moving towards faith, she's honest about, she's getting revelation from God, which is a big deal. We get revelation from God. It's called scripture. 
and she gets her revelation from God, and then she has questions. You get revelation from God, and you have questions. So we have something amazing in common with Mary. This is awesome. But look at the angels. He doesn't say, like, oh, you're an idiot. He says, the angel, he or she, I don't know how angels, I don't think they have gender. But uh, do, you, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. If an angel is saying to you, don't be afraid, a supernatural being, and they're a messenger of God, I have a feeling they have enough intuition to realize she was afraid. <laughs> like, it's not like the angel is starting off by realizing the situation and going, you're afraid, let me meet you where you're at and tell you, it's okay. Don't be afraid. Don't call the Ghostbusters. Okay, I know. Second time. Okay, cool. I'm glad you guys are with, a couple of you are with me. You got to realize, never mind. I won't chase the, Allie would say, just keep going. Show me your serious side, Steve. You can do it. That's what she's thinking. All right, I'll try. Don't be afraid, Mary, you've found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and call his name Jesus. Those next words are something impossible. It has never happened before. It has never happened since. It is a supernatural thing. I don't think she would believe it was possible unless it happened. I don't believe she would believe the message unless it came from an angel. This is... For someone from the outside, you're probably thinking, this sounds completely insane. And you're going to conceive in your womb? But, and she's thinking, this is insane. She has never been with a man. She's not even married. And she is completely skeptical of this whole thing. The angel immediately uses points to scripture which is amazing which is what when we deal with skepticism what i would encourage you to is to look to the scriptures the angel says we need to give you some historical validity to what's about to happen like you can't just throw a statement out like a virgin's going to conceive and then not back it up with some kind of historical legitimacy he will be great he will be called the son of the most high he the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. This is, this is coming from Isaiah 9, 7. This is coming from 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16. Then it says he will, be, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. That's from Numbers 21, 7. And his kingdom, there will be no end. Isaiah 9, 7. The angel's like, I got to tell you, this person, this is the one that all of the prophets in this whole book, all of the people who wrote, they said someone is going to come. All the way back to Genesis 3, 15. Someone's coming. A Messiah. And, and the Jews at times had misunderstood. Is he going to be a king who defeats all our enemies? Is he going to be a servant? Is he going to? And they pieced it all together. And the angel says, let me help you piece it together. A king of kings from the throne of David who's going to reign forever. Who fulfills all of this in one person. And she's like, all right. Mary said to the angel, how will this be? I am a virgin. See, a lot of times we... I don't know really the answer. Because I could say, you're skeptical to this or you're new to this, and I get it, it's hard to hear. And I just want you to be encouraged because I realize as much as Scripture is the answer, she heard Scripture and still had questions. Mary, you hear Scripture and you still have questions too. How does this piece together with this? And how about this? And what about this? And then on top of your questions, which come from deep inside of here, our culture raises all the questions, including is supernatural even exist? Are there many ways to God? Is there one way to God? 
I mean, why is evil allowed to endure? And so you have all that stirring out here, and you have all this stirring in here. There's a lot more than just read it and all your problems are solved. But that's a start. Read it. Study it. Investigate it. Test it. And don't, and I would say this, don't just take one side. I mean, YouTube is not the authoritative source for what this says. Richard Dawkins does not have a degree in theology. He has a degree in biology. So let him be the expert on biology and talk to someone who has a theology degree about this book, please. That's my, I'm just asking you to do that. So the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit, she has questions. How is this going to happen? She still has questions. So he points to scripture. Now the, I got louder, that was cool. Now, still, now in the midst of this, the question is still answered. See, a lot of times we don't have a frame of reference for supernatural. If you've never seen an angel, what's your frame of reference to say that's an angel? You would say, well, it's a ghost, or I'm seeing a vision, or I'm having a dream. Or you would, what's your frame of reference for the supernatural? What's our frame of reference for the supernatural? She has no frame of reference, so the angel is helping her out here and gives her a little bit of a frame of reference. Here's the answer to how. The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. That's the answer number one. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. The answer number two, the power of the Most High. This is a reference all the way back to Abraham in a story with Abraham and Melchizedek. And you're like, who's Melchizedek? But listen, it's a reference to God. And it says, the answer is the Most High God and his power. So is it illogical to think that a supernatural God could do something supernatural? I would say that's the very definition of logical. We'll come back to that. But then, so that's a kind of high in the sky answer. Here's the like hit home answer that the angel gives to Mary. Because if you read, uh, for the sake of time we can't, but for the Luke chapter 1, there's a story about her cousin Elizabeth. Now the angel is pointing to this as a frame of reference for the supernatural. Elizabeth, in her old age, is able to supernaturally conceive a son. Elizabeth has no frame of reference for this except for ancient times when Abraham and Sarah were able to conceive Isaac. So this is not something that happens every day. Elizabeth has never experienced anything like that, but God worked through Elizabeth so that it did happen, so that that could be a frame of reference. Her story could help encourage Mary in her story. You have to have some kind of frame of reference for the supernatural if you're going to actually believe in it. So, her, she's getting the validity to the story, to the supernatural that she was looking for, and the validity is this. Behold, your relative, your cousin Elizabeth, in her old age will conceive a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was child barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am, the, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So really quickly, I just want to ask us a couple questions and we walk through this. We just interact with this. What is the impossible? The angel says nothing will be impossible with God. So the question is, is what is impossible? And, and in my weird brain, and you can digest this however you feel led, I ask the question this. Okay, we live in a culture where it's almost like everything's relative, right? So how about this, for the f- sake of argument? What if the impossible is relative? Now, I don't believe truth is relative, personally, but I'm just saying, if you're a person who th- believes that truth is relative, or then you don't really have a frame of reference to objectively say impossible is impossible. Impossible is now subjective. If everything's subjective, then impossible is subjective. You don't know. And if that's where we're at, then I would go and push in and say, okay, if we could just arrive there philosophically, what do we know? 
we have this limited knowledge. There's not a person in this room or a person on the planet that has 100% knowledge of the whole universe, so how can you rule out that God exists if you don't have 100% knowledge of the whole universe? You cannot rule out that God exists. It's impossible because you do not have all knowledge. But what you can do is say, I don't believe in him, and that's a choice. See, it is a choice that we all make. Now, a person who's a believer doesn't have to have all knowledge to believe in God. They just have to have limited knowledge. They just have to say, there is some evidence that God exists, and I believe that evidence. And that is a personal decision. So we just flip the table. And you say, well, I don't like the evidence. Okay, why? When you, back to the first question I asked. For the child whose father comes home from a long period of time, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing if the dad is good. It's a bad thing if the bad dad is abusive. We don't want to believe in the supernatural or God or Jesus if he's cruel. It doesn't matter how much evidence in the world there is. I don't want to believe that if he's cruel. The angels declared he's good. I believe he's good. You say, well, there's so many rules. In the mm, everything in this world has rules, okay? So that rules don't, you're a parent in the room. You have rules for your kids. Are you cruel just because you have rules? No. You have rules because you care <laughs> and you want discipline and structure. That God wants discipline and structure too. Was, is that unreasonable for his created beings to have? Okay. I digress. What's impossible? And I just want to make a little bit of an example or just kind of go through some of the things in my head, and that is rare and unlikely are not the same thing as impossible. Angels showing up, rare and unlikely, doesn't mean it's impossible. A virgin conceiving, rare and unlikely, doesn't mean. None of us have a time machine to go backwards and say, there's no way that happened. You weren't there. So we have to make a, a faith decision to say, well, there's a record that says it happened. Is this a biased record? Is this a flawed record? Is this something they made up? You say, well, scientifically, no one could conceive. Well, this doesn't say scientifically she conceived. It says supernaturally, a supernatural God did something supernatural. So what's impossible? And when we just think of the words impossible, you think about it in your own life. You, you, maybe you think, okay, I want to do this job, but that's impossible. I want, to, I want to overcome this addiction. Well, that's impossible. I want hope for my marriage, but that's impossible. I got too much baggage. I got too much hurt. I, I want to get into church, and, but it feels impossible. I'm not really a churchy person. I want to overcome whatever you're dealing with. It says it feels impossible. Well, why are we letting a voice in our head tell us some things are impossible that may be possible? You know, I wanted to go into the NBA. That was impossible. But I believed it was possible. So there is a such thing as being delusional. All right. But I do want to challenge what we know. You know, uh, there's a picture I wanted to pull up. It's uh, Hubble. Hopefully it's not. Yeah, that looks good. All right. Edwin Hubble. Don't know a ton about this, but I do know this. I was reading about it this week. This invented this telescope, peering into space. At that time, the predominant view was that our galaxy was the universe. And he discovered that there are billions of galaxies. We would be silly to just say we have figured it all out. That's what I think. But we can look at evidence and we have to make a decision about the evidence that we get. Until, that is a big telescope. Until you had, he had something like that to show. We, why, of course we thought our universe was so small. Maybe in your faith you're thinking of such a small universe that it could be so much bigger of, with faith. You know, I was thinking of another one, and, and it's, we, we're really, this is a hometown thing, right, brothers? You know, other people had dabbled with flight, but no one had thought it possible. They said it's impossible. 
sustainable flight. They did it. When they did it, it was like it was a miracle. It was like, are we seeing something supernatural in front of us? How does this happen? It was a wonder. They had never seen anything like it. It was magical. But you know what? Right now, in 2019, going on 2020, we could, we could jump in a plane and fly across the world. It's no big deal. We've taken the wonder out of something. It's, it's become ordinary. Because, why? That's why I'm pushing in and saying some of this stuff, in, in a sense, is relative. Because we believe things are impossible that, who? Impossible to who? You know, impossible to me, that's one thing. Impossible to you, that's another thing. Impossible to us collectively. Impossible to science. Okay, maybe. But impossible to God. The angel says a statement. For nothing will be impossible with God. With God. What does that mean? It didn't say nothing's impossible. Which is kind of what we've been challenging so far. But it says with God. And, and there's a couple things just as a, you know, and we'll go through quick. Oh, oh, I had a third example. Titanic. <laughs> Unsinkable. What's that mean? It's impossible for this ship to sink. So sure. So sure. There it sits. We made that with our hands, and we called it unsinkable. What do we know? What do we know? Is it foolish to take a historical book and say, maybe it did happen? No, it says with God. It doesn't just say with us. It doesn't say what you want to do. You can do it. Nothing's impossible with you. It says nothing's impossible with God. You know, there's a couple things we got to frame that with. Number one is, this does not mean that God will do anything that we want. Some of us have a problem with the statement, including me, when you first read it. Nothing's impossible with God. And our immediate objection is, well, he didn't do the thing I wanted him to do. It doesn't say nothing is impossible for you the way you want it, when you want it, how you want it. Look, if there is a God and he is sovereign over all, if there's a God, he would have to be sovereign over all. And if he's sovereign over all, he doesn't just do what we tell him to do then he wouldn't be God. He would be like our pet. We have to admit that. And then that's where it gets hard because the alternative is he's not our pet. He's something we have to submit to. Not that we're his pet, but he's Lord. And that is always a rub with me. His ways are not my ways. But God I didn't want them to have that diagnosis. God, I didn't want to lose them. It was too soon. God, I didn't want this and this and this fill in the blank. And those are real things that we wrestle with together. And I'm with you. But we, we have to frame this and go, look, it's, it's not logical for us to expect him to do everything we want him to do. It is logical for us to expect him to do what he deems sovereignly wise. Would you want to follow God that wasn't wise? That wasn't, would you want to follow him if he wasn't smarter than you? I don't know. Would you follow your boss who's not smart? Some of you are like, I don't. <laughs> you wouldn't follow None of us would. So we, he either is smarter than us, wiser than us, more powerful than us, or he isn't. The second kind of just preface of with God nothing is impossible is that he will not violate his word. So, so when we say um, God is all powerful, for example, that's a, a theological statement. God is all powerful. We're not saying God can do anything. 
We're saying God can do anything power can do in that statement. So can God make a square circle? That's not a thing to ponder. That's, we know the answer. He cannot. He will not because he's a logical person. Oh, logical. He will not violate logic. You're like, but you're talking about a virgin birth. That doesn't sound very... Lo- I'm just, look, from where I sit, what I think is I think it seems very logical to expect a supernatural God to do something supernatural. We're not saying that he did something in the realm of science, which is the study of the natural world. We're saying he did something above and transcendent above, and it's rare and unlikely, but he did it. That's what makes it so great. That's why we call it hope. That's why we call it a miracle. It doesn't exist in this realm of the normal and the ordinary, or else we would do it. All right. There was all the philosophical stuff that Steve had to say. Look at this passage. Nothing will be impossible with God. What does that, okay, so that's big. What does that mean for you and me? And here's a couple things that, that I, I, I've written down. We have attainable hope. Our salvation went from impossible to possible. Jesus, okay, we're talking about virgin. We're talking about him before he's born. But as he grew up, the, the third chapter of John, he has his, one of the first interactions he ever has with a Pharisee. A Pharisee is a person who has a Ph.D. in the law equivalent, right? Ph.D. equivalent. They didn't name it, stuff like that back then. But, but this is a person who spent their whole life studying the ins and outs of the law and the application of it. A Pharisee. Jesus has an interact with, interaction with him, Nicodemus. And old Nicodemus was like, I got something to tell you, Jesus. I got to learn you, bro. All right? And, and they have this back and forth. It's a beautiful conversation. And out of that conversation comes one of our favorite verses, which is John 3.16. But before he got to John 3.16, he says this, Jesus says this statement, and he's trying to point Nicodemus to see how it's impossible to earn heaven. See, Nicodemus was thinking, oh, I'm going to do all these laws. I'm going to earn heaven. And, and, and in John chapter 3, actually, I'm going to flip there really quick. John chapter 3, Jesus says to him, Truly, I say unto you, unless one is, verse 5, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Here's Jesus saying that something that can't be done. An angel just said, oh, nothing's impossible with God. Jesus is saying something that can't be done. How do we fit those things together? Everything can be done, something can't be done. Because with God, nothing can't be done. And in God, in what he said would be done. And Jesus is saying, what must be done is a person has to be born again. You're like, born again? I was born once. That was good enough. He says, no, no, no. You had a physical birth. And he's using an analogy and saying, you need a spiritual birth. You, you, you need to actually literally be reborn. You say, well, well, every religion is talking about how to be a good person in one way or another. Listen, listen, listen. True, I don't even know if I can call it Christianity, but true Christianity that stems on the core of who Jesus is and what Jesus taught teaches that the only people who can be made right with God are not who earned it, but who receive a free gift. So that is distinctive from every religion in the whole world. On top of that, it is another distinctive is that it, it not only that it can't be earned, but it's, do you see the beauty of that? Receiving a free gift, grace. Okay, so back to Luke. Nothing should be impossible. Our, sal- our salvation went from impossible to, po- uh, it's attainable. In other words, the very essence of what this angel is saying, look, you thought it was impossible that a, a baby would be born. You thought it was impossible the Messiah was never coming. He's here. He is our salvation. It's real. It went from high apple pie in the sky, impossible, to tangible, I can attain it for myself. And then that's what Jesus said. 
you, you can have a spiritual birth. Anyone who puts their personal faith in Jesus Christ becomes born again. We try to complicate it. Oh, you got to, well, no, no, no. You got to trust him and do this. Mm -mm. I reject that 100%. Read the Bible. It says, I mean, faith, faith alone, faith alone, faith alone, faith alone, not being good enough. We, by the way, we can't be good enough. Like, okay, well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a moral person. Good job. Proud of you. But listen, even the best of us, when we work together, we still have flaws. And by the way, we still have trouble working together. Why do you think there's so many denominations? Even us faith-filled people can't work together. Even pastors, you're like, I look up to my pastor. Okay, that's fine. But I ain't perfect. I am far from perfect. I sat up here and repented of my sins and told God I am not worthy to preach a message because that is 100% true. I'm on the stage not because I'm better than someone sitting down there, but hopefully you can see me better. That's it. And, and if that's a mental block, we'll tear the stage down. I don't care about a stage. Or I'll come sit up here. There's no perfect person. There was one. His name is Jesus. And he is now attainable hope. We have attainable faith. If we never challenge the impossible, then we will never grow. Look, this is first and foremost a philosophical challenge about how you think about the impossible. And hopefully that moves you a step closer towards where Jesus is in the scriptures. So that you can come one-on-one one -on -one with him and believe in him and who he was. I'm not asking you to become city hope believer. I'm, I'm saying be Jesus believer. 100% face-to-face -face with him. That's the first and foremost most important thing. But this also has implications in everything we do. If we, can, if we never challenge what people say to us is impossible... There would be no Hubble telescope. There would be no flight. And there would be no one in the NBA. Because if everyone realized what I realized in that sense and they said it was impossible, then no one would be there. There would be no pro athletes if everyone said it was impossible. There would be no Olympics. You just say it's impossible, it's pointless. We must challenge the things that are said to be impossible. Sometimes it is your mind that is telling you this is impossible. You're struggling with depression. You're struggling with, struggling with anxiety. You're struggling with how do I be, be a good mom when I feel pulled in a thousand directions, working a job, cleaning the dishes, doing this. How do I be a good, how can I be a good dad when I feel like I've screwed up so much? It feels impossible. Not everything that feels impossible is impossible. Not everything our brain tells us is impossible is impossible. Sometimes it feels impossible to get up out of the bed in the morning. And then I realize there's coffee. And I get my butt out of bed. The last thing is, if we have, we have attainable strength, we don't answer to our fears anymore. They answer to God. I see a teenage girl afraid of an angel, afraid of the situation, humbled, has questions, has doubts, has fears. God met her where she's at with answers. God met her where she's at with information. Look how she responded. Bless her heart. It's beautiful. Behold, I'm a servant of the Lord. I hear beautiful submission to a very real God that she interacted with. And if you want to read the rest of the story, this blows me away too. She, she, she's submitted to God, and this also has an S. She wrote a song about God. Read the rest of the chapter later today. Verse 47, my soul magnifies. We get to read her song that she sings to God. It pass, it's passed on from generation to generation to generation. Her impact will never be forgotten. She went from a doubter 
filled with fear. She got her questions answered. She went to faith, submission, and a song. Whoa. An eternally impactful song, by the way. So here's the last statement. When you are up against something impossible, keep making steps forward. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your anxiety. Maybe it's your situation. You're up against something impossible. Keep making steps forward. Why do I say that? You know, uh, the beginning of 2018, I went on a missions trip, and we... I thought it was a good idea to go hike up a mountain. (laughs) Laura, it's out of order probably, but you can pull that up. Look, see those little teeny tiny dots? That's us going up a mountain. And what I did not realize, because I'd hiked mountains in Virginia before, is that on each side of me, there was no trees, there's nothing. It's just barren. And I felt like I was going to fall once I got up there. There was nothing around me. And I have a little bit of a thing with heights, but I really didn't think it would bother me. It surprised me, and it was embarrassing because there was a 12-year-old hiking with us. But I got to a certain point, and I looked over, and it was so far up that I went like this. And I was afraid to admit that I could not take a step forward. Everything in my emotions, everything in my brain was telling me, This is impossible. You will fall. You can't go forward. It wasn't like an anxiety attack. I didn't start hyperventilating anything. I just, I took a knee because I thought I was going to fall. My body was telling me I was going to fall. And I told Chad, our group leader, and he, I could tell he probably thought I was preposterous a little bit. And Brandon Clark, some of y'all might know him. He was kind of up ahead. He came back, and he goes, Steve, you can't go back. It's going to be more dangerous for you to go backwards the way we just went. You got to go forward, and we'll help you. Let me pray for us. God, We love you. We're here. We're listening to you today. We just want to move forward when we face the impossible. God, we're, we're humbled by your word. It's big. It says big things. Just let us leave here today ready to take steps forward pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, for you, maybe you're like,